So assalamu alaikum and thank you for coming. Today is one of the most important and blessed nights in the history of humanity. For the simplest reason, if you were to ask me one reason why, at least for Muslims, today was the night when the five prayers, which is the second pillar of Islam, was ordained for Muslims. So if you, someone asks you, where did God order Muslims to pray five times a day? It was on the night of Miraj. But it is also, from a human perspective, also perhaps the most important moment in human history because the actual distance between a human being and God was less than six feet. Unfortunately, I made a mistake in the email that I sent you. I said the actual distance between man and God was three bow lengths. It's actually two bow lengths. Even less than that. Yes, less than two bow lengths. But there are people who actually say that two bow lengths means, you've seen the bow, right? It's like this. And so the distance between the two bow lengths is where they meet, which is practically nothing. Half. This much. It's like the two bow lengths where the bows meet that is the distance which is nothing. Zero. So they just touch. So the distance between God and human being was nothing. So that is why this is perhaps the most spiritually important night. While Muslims, most practicing Muslims are aware of Miraj and may even be aware of its significance. And if they have been paying attention in mosques or in whatever schools they have, they have some rudimentary knowledge about it too. But it is also a very important uh, concept in all religions nearly. This idea of having a divine encounter while you're alive. To have a divine encounter with the divine while you're alive is a very important vision. Until yesterday, I didn't know that even St. Paul's had talked about visiting the third heaven. And even the Zoroastrians literally have such an exact version of Miraj that some Orientalists for a few years actually argued that Muslims had copied the story of Miraj from the Zoroastrians until the reverse was proven. And it was the other way around that the Zoroastrians had completely incorporated the story of Miraj. Hindus have talked about darshan all the time. It's a very important concept for them to have this awareness of the divine concept. So where am I? Why am I involved in this? Like some of you are aware that about two, two and a half years ago, I started thinking about the concept of Essa and started researching. Then I traveled many Muslim countries, over 140,000 miles, and attended many sohbas and zaviyas in Turkey, a lot in Turkey and in Morocco and in Tunisia and in Egypt. And I kept asking people about Ehsan, and I'm an academic, so before I ask you a question about Ehsan, I read everything up that there is to read about Ehsan. So if you tell me what is there in the books, it doesn't help. Because you should assume that I have already read everything there is to read, unless it is in a language that I can't access. So while I was talking and reading this, I suddenly realized that there are many ways of thinking of Ehsan. Ehsan is not just how you interact with each other. Ehsan is not just how you worship. Ehsan is not how you think. But Ehsan is also a moment. It is also a moment in time. It's a beautiful moment in time. There are many debates about the narrative. There are many ahadis, etc. When people talk about Islamic sources, especially in legal terms, they talk about the Quran and the Sunnah, but when you're talking about non-legal sources, there are three sources that we look at, especially when you're looking at historical episodes. It's the Quran, the Hadith, and the Seerah of Prophet So there are some Quranic sources of this night, which I have in your handout, and we will look at them now. And then there are a Hadith, and then there are descriptions in the Sira. Now the traditions, <laughs> no, no, don't go there yet. The traditions in the Hadith, the Orthodox Muslims at some point decided that Bukhari and Muslim, if you find a Hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, it is the strongest position that you can get unless it is in every other traditional book. 
So the orthodox position now in, on Miraj, like if you were to go to a madrasa, if you go to Al-Azhar or Deoband, etc., and ask them what is the official narrative of Miraj, then they will tell you of the ahadith which are mawjood in, in Bukhari and Muslim. But they are not complete. The most interesting narrative, the most complete narrative is found some of them in Tirmidhi and Nisa, but in Ibn Ishaq's Sirat al-Nabi. And one of the most important books ever written on Prophet Muhammad, to be upon him, is called Ash-Shifa of Qadi Ayat. So I'm going to read you the Sira version from this. Qadi Ayat has become very popular now. All these discussions about blasphemy and punishing people, etc. All the sources that people are providing are all coming from Qadi Ayyad. And Ibn Taymiyyah's book is also based on Qadi Ayyad's biography. It's one of the, the best, more systematic, more, more interesting biographies of Prophet Muhammad. If you read the original of, of Ibn Hisham, it's very difficult reading because it's just narrations, narrations, narrations. But if you read Qadi Ayyad, he's taken the narrations and built a narrative. So it's much more easier to read. So let me first give you a little bit more background before I tell you the story of Miraj. If you go through Hadith books, you'll find that there are various degrees of detailed versions. Like the, the, the stories in Bukhari are not very detailed at all. The Khabars in Muslim are much more in detail. But they are still not. And then there are different reports from different companions which are very limited. Like the Prophet Sallallahu saw Moses, and he was praying, and he was tall and dark, and that's it. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, spoke with Jesus, and then that's the end. He met the particular angel of death, and so on and so forth. So there are just little snippets out there. But the whole narrative, the best in the first narrative is in Ibn Isaf, I will go there. But if you look at it from the point of debates that early Muslims, even the companions and the Sahaba, had about these debates. They had debates on so many things, and I'll tell you what they debated. They debated, first of all, as to when it happened. When did Miraj happen? It is amazing to me that there is no consensus as to when Miraj happened. There are many narratives. One, that it happened in the year that the Prophet ﷺ became the Prophet, between the first year of his mission, or minus nine Hijrah. Then there are reports that it happened in the fifth year. The one that people mostly agree upon is one and a half years before Hijrah. Okay, so roughly 11 and a half years after. But even in authentic traditional books, you will have competing, opposite, completely befuddling narratives. For example, Aisha radiallahu anha says that his body was there on the bed beside me. He did not leave me. Well, for that to be true, this had to happen in Medina, not in Mecca, because Aisha did not move in to stay with the Prophet until one year after Hijrah. But this is in the authentic collection of Hadith. There's another tradition where the Prophet ﷺ is quoted as saying that I came back to my bed and Khadija had not yet moved. And she was still sleeping there. So this would be before the 10th year. Because Khadija died in the 10th year of the Prophet's mission, or three years before he migrated. So there are all of these are authentic traditions out there. So it's very difficult to put together a narrative. So most serious scholars of tradition are able to live. See, that's what being a scholar is, to be, to be able to live with these contradictions and not have a good story in your mind. And then some scholars put together a story for other people. And I'm not going to do that. Okay. I will not do that. I'm going to treat all of you as adults, as grown-up Muslims. That's what I want grown-up Muslims. I'm not going to treat you as a child and tell you a bedtime story. That's not what this is all about. I will tell you what the debates are. That's the more important part of it. So the first debate is about when. And you know why it's so interesting and perplexing to me is because nobody remembers when Muslims started praying five times a day. 
because they start, it, it is baffling. Okay? Hazrat Ali probably became Muslim within a few months of the Prophet mission, but we have no tradition from him saying that I was 12, I was 14, I was 13, when suddenly we went from praying twice a day to five times a day. There, there should be a lot of Muslims, Abu Bakr, Khadija, no. It's not, the silence is amazing, it's very baffling as to me when we have details about little things, about the Prophet's shoes, about his clothes, but we don't know when they all started praying five times a day. So when I go into other details of the Mehraj, you must also keep in mind that while we have details about tiny things, we also have absolutely no knowledge about the big picture. Right? So the first debate is about it. By about the second century of Islam, after all the hadiths, Sahih Muslim and Bukhari were collected, and Ibn Hisham, maybe the third century, Tabari's tafsir had also come out. After all of this had happened, in the third and third century onwards, we started having an official narrative of the Miraj. And the official narrative of the Miraj, from then on, if somebody, if you just quickly ask the Imam, say, when did Miraj happen? He would say, well, about a year and a half before the Prophet migrated. But if you had asked any of the companions, they would have said, wait a minute. So, so by now, we had formed a consensus narrative about when the Miraj. The second debate is whether the Prophet ﷺ was transported in body or spirit. And I will talk about the rest of the debates, but I want to mention what the debates are after I tell you what happened. The second debate is whether he was transported in body or whether it was a dream sequence or whether he was having a spiritual moment. The third debate was, was about uh, what does it mean and what is the meaning of Miraj? Why did God do this? There are some answers in the Quran, some answers in the Sirah, and some in the Hadith. Uh, and then there is also a debate which you will probably appreciate more once I tell you the story about what transpired really, what really happened. We really don't know. A lot of it is speculation, especially the conversation between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All right, so now you can go to your first source. If you look at your first source, don't turn to pages. This is the first ayah from Surah Al-Isra. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subhanallah, asra bi abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa al-lazhi barakna hawlahu li nuriyahu min ayatina innahu huwa samiul basir. Now if you look at this, it says, exalted his he, subhanallah. People have spent more than 10 to 15 to 20 pages to just describe why there is this word, subhanallah, at the beginning of this ayah. And in the general consensus, Ahmad scholar is saying that to say that he is exalted, only he can do it. Only God could have transported Muhammad. There are many ways in which you can try. He transported him. He, as means he caused him to move. It is not that he traveled. If you see a translation, it says he traveled. No, he did not travel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused him to travel, caused him to move from this mosque to the other mosque in one night. And because it violates so many principles of physics, That you have to believe that only God can do this. It is only because God can do it that he was able to do this. That is, it's, it's, it's interesting. When I read it the first time, I would not, have, I would have thought it's part of innahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, but I didn't realize that there is so much meaning in just why this ayah begins with subhanahu. Now, if you look at it, it is just, I need to step back. When we talk of this night, we talk about the night as two parts, Isra and Miraj. Isra is horizontal movement. The Prophet ﷺ went from Mecca to Jerusalem. That is Isra. Miraj is the vertical movement. Miraj literally means a ladder. So the word ascension, that is in English translation, Miraj is translated as ascension to ascend. So the Prophet ﷺ ascended into the heavens. The second part is Miraj. So if you look at this ayah, this ayah is about 
Isra, but not about Miraj. So the way Muslim scholars have understood is that when he says that night Masjid al-Haram to al-Masjid, so the word Asra is already exalted, is who took or caused his servant by night from al-Masjid al-Haram to al-Masjid, that is about Asra. But to show him our signs includes the concept of Miraj. To show him our signs are part of the Miraj narrative. So I'm going to give you first the orthodox version, and then I will tell you the, the bigger version. Now, this, if, if someone were to ask you to do a literature review of the hadith, and say, okay, take all the hadith narratives about Isra and Miraj and put them together so that I'll ask you a test. Any clever graduate student will cluster them into two parts, Ibn Abbas and the rest. All the narratives that are associated with Ibn Abbas and those who come from the others. And what is interesting is that each and individual narration that comes from Ibn Abbas is considered as authentic, as sahih. So every tradition that, everything that Ibn Abbas has to say about Miraj and Isra is considered authentic, not just by Sahih Muslim, in which they are found, but also they are included in Imam Ahmad's Masnad. So for those of you who understand today's politics between Salafis and Sufis, and their battle over issues like Mehraj and other things, you can understand that the sources that everybody is using when they talk about Ibn Abbas are already authenticated by Imam Ahmad bin Hamba. Is, that's a very important thing for us to remember. When, I, when, you, when you listen to the Ibn Abbas's narrative, you will immediately say, oh, wait, whoa, and then you must recognize that it is in Sahih Muslim, and you must also recognize that Imam Ahmed said that these are correct and valid ones. Okay, so this is how the narrative goes. The Prophet, I'm putting together the, all the authentic hadith and telling you this. The Prophet Wasallam said that there are two versions, that he was at home and his rope was blown over. And the other was, and he was taken to Mecca, to the Hatim area. If you've seen the picture of Mecca, that little area that is marked off into that area. Or tradition would start with Anas bin Malik's narratives. They say he was already sleeping there. And Jibril alayhi salam came to him, Prophet Jibril, and woke him up with his foot, literally. He said, get up. And the Prophet salam got up, went to sleep, and did it three times. And then after the third time, when he woke him up, he cut him open from here till here. He cut him open, and there were two more angels who came with a bowl, and they took Zamzam. Zamzam is the holy water that Muslims get. It, it, it's, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Zamzam. Zamzam well is very close to Hatim. So he took the water from Zamzam, and he says he washed the heart of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and filled it with faith. To me, this was amazing that in the 10th year, the Prophet ﷺ is now nearly 51, 51 and a half, has been the Prophet for one and a half years. He is the Prophet who has been sent to all things. He's not just a Prophet to all human beings. He's a Prophet to everything that has been created. He's the Prophet for planets, for animals, for trees, for everything. This Prophet had to be filled with faith at that point. So after his heart was filled with faith, then an animal was brought, which was a little bigger than a donkey, a little smaller than a mule, was white, and it had wings, which interestingly, in the traditions, the companions who were listening to this seemed to recognize and say, is that Burakh? And they said, yes, that is Burakh. And the Burakh behaves in quite a strange manner. As Jibril al Islam said, God has called you, summoned you, Get on Barak, and Barak moved away. And Jibril told Barak, don't you know this is the prophet of Islam, wait. And Barak started sweating, and generally he was acting up. But the prophet sat on him, and they say that Barak's each stride was to where your eye could go in the horizon. As far as the rider could see, each step was there, and they went to Jerusalem, went to battle Maqdis. Now, this Masjid al-Aqsa, which basically literally means the far away mosque. There are some companions who believe that this is not a mosque on earth. Because somewhere else in the Quran, 
Palestine has been referred to as the near land. Aden, Aras, I think, Aden, something. So Palestine has been referred to as the near land. So if the mosque is far mosque, then which mosque is it? But the broad consensus is that this is in Jerusalem, this is Solomon's temple. And so the Prophet ﷺ reaches there, he ties Burakh to a hole in the wall, he goes in there and he's introduced to all the prophets, all the prophets from Adam until Jesus, and the prophet leads them in prayer. Now there are two versions, the official versions also have two versions, where this happens first. And then the prophet, after he leads them in prayer, he comes out and he's offered these drinks, wine or milk, water, he chooses milk. And Jibril tells him, you have chosen well, because if you had chosen wine, then your ummah would have gone astray. This is the fitra that you have chosen. It is a natural thing to do. It is very, some traffic has his nature, but it's a natural thing to do. And then they actually ascend into heavens using a ladder. The other narratives, the Prophet ﷺ arrives to the mosque after he has already visited the heavens and leads the companions in prayer for two rakats fajr. So this is the first time they are praying two rakats fajr. So, this is a, so he leads them in prayer for two rakats fajr and then departs to Mecca. So there are these two versions, you choose whichever you like. Now what, is, what the Prophet has been done here is that he has already been now established as the Imam of East and the West. But he has also been established as the Imam of all the Prophets. So he's not just the Imam of his Ummah, but he's also the Imam of all the Prophets. It was not led by Ibrahim salam. it was not led by Adam, the prayer was led by Prophet Muhammad. So the message is coming very clear that this is the most important of companions of Prophets. And then he climbs up into the heaven. And there is this repetitive, the hadith gets constantly repetitive, which is very interesting. So they reach the gate of the first heaven and then there's a voice that comes in and says, who is there? And Jibril al-Islam says, this is Jibril. You have brought a man with you. He says, this is Muhammad Rasulullah. So the angel in the gate asks, so has Muhammad's mission begun? And Jibril says, yes, yes. And then the angels, all the angels in the heavens say, Marhaba ya Rasulullah, Marhaba ya Rasulullah. So the whole universe echoes with this Marhaba Ya Rasulullah. In India and Pakistan, there are lots of people who have written these poems and songs, etc., etc., uh, about Marhaba Ya Rasulullah. I'm going to read you just one of them, just four lines. Muhammad, you travel to heavens high. The angels address you with welcome. The inhabitants of the heavens too said, welcome a hundred times, welcome. Rabbi Salim Allah Rasulullah, Marhaba, Marhaba Rasulullah. And this goes on and on and on. Okay, so the first person that he, the Prophet meets in the first heaven is Adam. And Gabriel says, wish him, he is your father, Adam, and Adam wishes him. And Adam welcomes him and prays upon him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as the Prophet leaves, he turns and sees Adam. First he's crying, he looks to the right and cries, he looks to the left and laughs, he looks to the right and cries, he looks to the left and laughs, and the Prophet tells him, why is he behaving like that? He says, when he looks at the hell, he sees his children in hell, and he cries. And then when he looks at the heavens, he sees his children in heaven, and he laughs. Because remember, all of humanity are his children. Then he goes to the second heaven, and then the same protocol, who is there? Does he have person? Yes, he has been called. And in the second heaven, he meets the cousins, Yahya and Isa, Islam. He meets them, and the same thing, they wish each other, and they bless him. Then he goes up to the third heaven. In the third heaven, he meets Joseph, Yusuf. In the fourth heaven, he meets Idris, or Enoch, which is very interesting. I don't know how much you know about Idris, al there is a verse in the Quran which says Idris was an honest man and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised him in heavens. 
One of my goals after reading this whole narrative is to learn a little bit more about, we hear so little about Idris al-Islam, but his stature in heaven is in the fourth heaven. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled his promise to Idris. He said he, he will raise you in stature in heaven. And then they go to the fifth heaven where they find Aaron or Harun al-Islam. And on the sixth, they find Musa. And Musa is described in several tr traditions and in this narrative as tall and dark, much older. He meets with the Prophet ﷺ and he starts crying. And <laughs> Jibril says, why? Prophet ﷺ asks Jibril, why is he crying? And he says, he is such a young man and more of his followers will go to heaven than mine. That is Moses' comment. And then they go. This is the sixth. Moses is in the sixth heaven. Then they knock on the seventh heaven. And seventh heaven is very interesting. There they meet Ibrahim alayhi salam, who is once again introduced as his father. Everybody else are introduced as brothers, except Adam and Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam actually has a lineage, and of course so does Adam. And there is a separate hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said all the prophets are brothers from different mothers. It's a very interesting tradition that we are all brothers from different mothers. That's how the Prophet ﷺ described his relationship with other prophets. So when he goes on the seventh heaven, he meets Ibrahim Islam, and there, there is Ibrahim Islam, or Abraham is sitting which is back to a house which is called Baitul Mamur. Now, Bayt al Mamur is the Kaaba of the heavens. It is the same thing. The Bayt al that we have here, it is there. And the tradition says that every day 70,000 angels enter Bayt al Mamur to pray and they leave and they will never come back. They will only get a second chance when the earth, will, everything will come to an end on the day of judgment. So, the whole idea is to, to emphasize how many angels are there who are constantly worshipping God. So Bayt al Mamur is like the Kaaba in the heavens. But at this point, beyond the Bayt al Mamur, there is this place, a tree called Sidratul Muntaha. It is a tree, in English it's translated as Lot tree. Don't ask me why, I have to figure it out. Some people even translated it as Lotus. And the Prophet, in the Hadith, the Prophet said it was a giant tree, very giant. Its leaves were as big as the ears of an elephant. And its fruits were as big as the jars of a place he mentions in Yemen, so about six feet high. So the fruits that were there were like this big, like huge sized fruits. And then that the tree is covered. Covered with something so beautiful that Prophet said, I do not have words to describe. Okay, now in the official narrative, after this, at this point, Jibril says, Go ahead. I cannot go beyond this point because if I go beyond this point, my wings will get burned. I cannot go beyond this point and Prophet Sallallahu goes ahead. There is a separate hadith, a separate tradition. From, For some reason, it is not often included in the narrative of, of Isra and Miraj where Prophet Sallallahu said, I had a special time with my Lord a time where even Jibreel could not go. This is that moment when Prophet ﷺ had this moment. Now in the official narrative, he comes back from there. The official narrative does not tell us what happened. He comes back. And he comes back and he's encountered by Moses. And Moses asks him, so what have you got from your Lord? And Prophet ﷺ says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us to pray 50 times a day. And Moses says, oh, come on. <laughs> I know your people and my people. This is not going to happen. Go back and ask your Lord to reduce it. So Prophet ﷺ goes back. He reduces it by 10, comes back, and he goes back, and comes back, goes back, and comes back. Finally, it's 5. And Moses says, look. I know my people, and I know your people. Five is too much. They cannot do that. Go back and get it reduced to one prayer a day. And Prophet said, I am shy. I am shy. I don't think I can go back. And then they hear the voice, which says, five days of prayer have been chosen by your Lord, 
and it has been ordained and made obligatory upon your ummah. And then the Prophet ﷺ either goes back to, depending on which narrative you're reading, goes back and leads the prayer, comes back. Now in the official version, there is no account of return journey. It stops here. This is the official account. Okay. It doesn't even fill the gap that you will see in the in the Quranic narrative of this. There is more in the Quranic narrative about the coming back than in, in this official hadith. Okay, and uh, and I will show you where that is. So if you go to the next hadith, seventeen sixty. Indeed, your Lord, and remember, O Muhammad, when we told you, indeed, your Lord has encompassed the people, and we did not make the sight which we showed you except as a trial for the people. Now, this particular, this is the 60th ayah in Surah al Isra. Now, what happens is once the Prophet ﷺ comes back, he is now in a state of worry. He's worried as to how people are going to respond. If he tells them what happened to him. So in that state of worry, he goes to the mosque. And he's sitting there worried. And he has not shared this with anybody else. The irony of history is so incredible. Guess who, he sh who is the first person he shares this with? So while he's sitting there looking worried, Abu Jahl of all people. If there are two people who were the biggest enemies of the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl at that time. Abu Jahl walks in, he sees the Prophet. It seems so modern. He comes and sits next to him and says, what's new? That's the question Abu Jahl asks. What's new? Mal Jadid, what's new? The Prophet ﷺ shared it. He said, last night I was taken from my bed in this mosque here. I was sleeping to, to Jerusalem. And Jahel listens to it and says, and now this morning you're with us. So he says, yes. He said, are you sure? He said, yes. I was taken by my Lord. To... So he stands up and he claps and calls people and says, please come here see Muhammad has something to tell you. And people are shocked. Muslims are shocked. Non-Muslims there who are shocked, they're listening to this story. A lot of people left Islam at this point because they did not believe this story. How could you go? There were some people in the audience who had actually been to the Temple of Solomon in Baitul Maqbal and they started asking specific questions. And the Prophet says that when they started asking me specific questions about it, I could not remember some of the details that they were asking. You know, like, does Muqtadar have a two car garage or a one and a half car garage? How many of you can tell me? <laughs> Many of you have been here more than five, six times, but I'm sure you can't confirm that. Right? Questions like this, I guess, is too specific. So Prophet ﷺ said that God made the vision appear right in front of him. So he just looked at it and described the, the, what he saw. As a result of that vision, he was seeing Betul Mahdas right there in front of him as he was answering their questions. There is another interesting tradition where the... I don't know whether it's the Eastern Roman Empire or it must have been Eastern Roman Empire where the Caesar suddenly hears that there are some businessmen and traders from Arabia who have come to this uh, to Damascus, I think, Sham. He says, call them to the Sufyan. And he says, I'm hearing about this prophet. Tell me about who is this prophet, who is this man that everybody is talking about. Abu Sufyan was a very smart and very diplomat. He didn't want to say anything that would pique his curiosity. He wanted to say something negative, something really bad about Prophet Muhammad. But he was also very smart. He didn't want to lie. He said, if I lied, I mean, he's, he's, the way Abu Sufyan, if I say something which is verifiably proven wrong, then I will lose my credibility among everybody. So he thought he wanted to say something that will undermine the mission of Prophet Muhammad in the eyes of these Christians. And so he says, well, his latest story is that he was transported from Mecca to Jerusalem, and then he came back in the same night. So Caesar started laughing. And then the patriarch of Jerusalem, who was in his court, said, I remember that night. And Caesar turns to him and says, what do you mean you remember that night? 
He said, yes, I remember the night. Uh, that night after the night prayer, I tried to shut the door. And one of the doors of the temple, I could not shut it. I tried my best. I called many helpers. Then I decided to leave it. And in the morning when I went there, I saw somebody had made a hole and tied an animal to it. I remember that night when this happened. So I realized that some prophet had come and prayed here. I didn't know it was Muhammad. I didn't know, but I knew at that time, I thought that some prophet had come here and prayed. So this is the official narrative. Okay. So what was the purpose of it? What was the purpose? So 1760 is the official explanation of what was the purpose. That Allah, um, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this to try us, to try people by this, this vision. And you must understand, it is a trial for the people not then but today also. It is a trial for people today also. Like for example, when I was reading Fadlur Rahman, the man was struggling to deal with it. He just could not say, I believe that this happened. And that is why he, needs, he should have gone back and said, why did God say, Subhana? That why is he exalted? Because he could do this. Okay? Because he could transcend all the physical laws of nature to do this. So all modernist Muslim scholars in the last hundred years who have written about it, they deny the bodily transportation of Prophet ﷺ. They say it's a vision. It happened in a vision. Early scholars didn't have, but this is not my opinion, somebody wrote that early scholars didn't have so much of an idea of psychological visions, etc., etc., all these idea of visions and mysticism, etc., ruya, the meaning of the word ruya all developed with the Sufi traditions later on. So 400 years, 500 later, when you say, I had a vision, people understood what happened, okay, that you're having a spiritual moment. But before that, it was either a dream or reality. It had to have happened in a real context or it should have been a dream sequence. So, but modern scholars say, no, it was a vision. It was not a dream. It was a vision, a psychological vision. And we know that now because people from many other religious traditions also claim to have had visions, etc. So it, that word flies in modern <coughs> terms. And I think that is what it also means. When it says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this, this is a trial for people, it means it is for us also. So when you are reading the Quran, you are a new Muslim, or you are a Muslim who is an accidental Muslim and then decides to become born again, <coughs> and you start reading and say, oh my God, what do I do with this? Especially if you are a physicist. And your dissertation was on gravitation. Okay. <laughs> so you, you are trying to work it out. So it is a trial. So this is the official version of the trial. Now let me tell you the difference in Ibn Abbas's narrative. All the discussions about hell, okay, in Ibn Abbas's narrative, there is one additional dimension, which is that the Prophet ﷺ on the way back visited heaven and hell. And so there are all these glimpses of people scratching their faces, and these are people who lied behind other people's back. Then there are stories of people who have been given cooked meat and they've been given raw meat and they discard cooked meat and they eat raw meat which has gone bad. These are adulterers and so on and so forth. So there are these different narratives about the hell and heaven. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about it. It's quite possible you're going to hear a lot more about it on Friday. But I'm going to read you about something you probably may not hear about Ibn Abbas's narrative which is very important. And that is what happened at Siddhar al at this tree, at this low tree, what happened. And so, this is, okay, this is what the Prophet says. There are, Qadi Ayyad drops out the first paragraph. So, so I'm going to, since I'm reading Ibn Abbas's version, I might as well read the, the full version of it. Okay, this is what he said. I saw a great matter which tongues cannot discuss and imagination cannot reach. This is the Prophet ﷺ being quoted by Ibn Abbas in his narrative which is considered as Sahih by lots of people. My sight was bewildered beside it to the point that I feared blindliness. So I closed my eyes and put trust in God. When I closed my eyes, God returned my vision to my heart and I began to gaze with my heart at what I had been gazing at with my eyes. 
I saw a light gleaming. I was forbidden to describe to you what I saw of his grandeur. I asked my Lord to favor me with steadiness of vision towards him in my heart in order to complete his blessing of me. My Lord did that and favored me with it and I gazed upon him in my heart until he made it steady. Do you remember that episode with Musa alayhi salam? Rabbi arini unzur alayka, O Lord, show me yourself so that I may gaze upon you. And you know what happened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I don't think you can see me. I will show myself to the mountain. Let's see what happens to the mountain. <laughs> a poet, an Arab poet, I think it was an Arab poet who said this. He says, Moses went out of his mind by a single revelation of God's attributes. You see the essences of the essence and still smile. He is referring to this moment of this terrain. This is a very important concept later. I'll explain to you this whole idea that the Prophet ﷺ steadily gazed upon what he saw. Then he said, when he inclined to me from his dignity, okay, follow this language because it's, this is also in the Quran when we discuss Surah Al-Najm. When he inclined to me from his dignity, glorified thee, he placed one of his hands. So, Ibn Abbas says that God leaned towards him. And he placed one of his hands between my shoulder blades and I felt the coolness of his fingers upon my heart for some time. Now you must understand that Muslims for 200 years debated very aggressively whether God is anthropomorphic or not, whether God is like a human being or not. God created Adam in his own image. That's what Muslims believe. Christians believe that God created all of human beings in their own image. So God is not anthropomorphic to some people. Ibn Han, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa says, look, God is not like anything, and the Quran says it. Right? He's not like anything that we can imagine. So if God says he has hands with which he made Adam, fine, we believe he has hands. But it is not like your hands or my hands. Right? So, but nevertheless, this is... So you can imagine why there is resistance to this hadith, where people who are saying, oh, this is becoming anthropomorphic, God is like a human being, has a hand which feels cold. Uh, his fingers upon my heart for some time. With that, I felt his sweetness, his beautiful fragrance, cool pleasure, and generous vision. All the terror that I had encountered vanished. His hand is on his heart, the heart that was purified by Jibril. My Lord, glorified and praised be he, spoke to me saying, Muhammad, do you know what the heavenly hosts debate? And of course, Muslims have debated this ever since. What, what is the meaning? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking Prophet Muhammad, do you know what do all these people who live in the heavens debate about? Okay. We, we are still debating it. I said, my Lord, you are most knowing in that and in all things. You are the one who knows things unseen, he said. They debate about the steps and goodness. There are two things that they are debating. One is darajat stages, and the other is about goodness. But I, then I said, then Prophet ﷺ is now addressing Lord. He says, I said, my Lord, you took Abraham as an intimate friend. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about him as Khalilullah or Waliullah, as his intimate friend. My Lord, you took Abraham as an intimate friend and you spoke to Moses directly. You raised Enoch to a high place, Idris, to a high place, to the fourth. You gave Solomon a kingdom not benefiting to anyone after him. And you gave David the Psalms. What is there for me, my Lord? And Prophet Sallallahu said, he said, Muhammad, I took you as an intimate friend, just as I took Abraham as my intimate friend. So, uh, so when you say Khalilullah, it ought to either mean Ibrahim or Islam, or it could mean Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu I spoke to you just as I spoke to Moses directly. I gave you the opening of the book, which is Fatiha, Surah Fatiha, the first chapter of the Quran, the seven most often repeated verses. I gave you the opening of the book and the seals of Surah Al-Baqarah. Based on this hadith, we conclude that the last ayats, or at least the last ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah was revealed at this point. So when the Prophet ﷺ came, he not only came with five prayers per day, but he also came with either the last or the last few ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah that revealed at this time. 
which are from the treasures of my throne. So Surah Fatiha and parts of Bakhara are, are written, some people say, on the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I have not given them to any prophet before you. I sent you to all the people of the earth, the white, black, and red, to the jinns and to the humans. I have never sent a prophet before to them all. Rahmatullil Alameen. He has been sent as mercy to all things, to all the worlds, all kinds of worlds that you can imagine. I made the earth, its land, and its sea ritually pure. This, to me, this is so fascinating. I made the earth its land and its sea ritually pure and a place of prayer for you and your community. We should not talk about holy land. It's holy earth. Every prayer on earth is holy. We can pray. This is very important. Then after this he informed me of matters about which he did not permit me to tell you. So the rest of the conversation we don't know. There is a lot of speculation about this conversation. And we'll come back to this. This Ibn Abbas's narration is very important. I don't know how many of you know Ibn Abbas, but the Prophet ﷺ once said that you should learn the Quran from four people. Ibn Masud and Ibn Abbas are two of those four people. He embraced Ibn Masud and prayed in public that Allah may give him knowledge. But Ibn Abbas was his cousin, his really cousin's son, he really loved this man, and he prayed to God that Ibn Abbas should get the knowledge of the Quran. When he was a young kid, he also sent him to live and spend some time with Jews to learn Hebrew. So Ibn Abbas also knew Hebrew as a young child, so he could communicate with them, read and write Hebrew texts. Uh, that's why later on Muslim scholars said Israeliyat came into Islamic interpretation from Ibn Abbas. But... If you look at all the Sahih Hadith narratives, if you take Bukhari, most of it is three people, Abu Huraira, Ibn Abbas, and Aisha. So these are the three. So Ibn Abbas, if you, are, you want to study the Quran, Ibn Abbas is the gate. If you want to study Hadith, Ibn Abbas is the Hadith. So it's very important to remember that Ibn Abbas is a very, very important person when it comes to knowledge about Islam. Plus, he's very special because he's respected by all the different groups. He's respected by Sunnis as well as Shias. So all the hadiths that are narrated by Ibn Abbas are accepted by Sunnis and Shias and Sufis and everybody, unlike other, other narrators of hadith who do not have the same, what do, what do we say in America, cross cross. cross crossover appeal that Ibn Abbas has. Nobody has that kind of appeal. So this is a very important narrative. This is not the official narrative. Muslims do not fully agree. The Sufis fully embrace this entire narration. Now, where is all this coming from? For example, then after this, he informed me of matters. So there is a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is going on, which we don't know about. So now I wanted to go back to the handout and look at Surah al -Najam. Okay. There are some very, very tiny minority of people actually argue that none of these ayahs from Surat al-Najm refer to Isra and Miraj because Surat al-Najm was revealed after Surat al-Isra. They're wrong. Uh, because surahs are not revealed. That's full surahs. Maybe Surat al-Fatiha, perhaps, and the last surah. But the big ones, the ayahs, for example, Surah Bakra was revealed over a period of two and a half Yes, for example, the end of Surah Bakra was revealed in Miraj, which is one and a half years before Hijrah, and the front end of a lot of Surah Al-Bakra is, is uh, Madinah, when they're talking about the Munafiq, etc. So the, so the sequences of the ayahs in the Quran are also not chronological. So let me lo look at the, the ayahs from Surah Al-Najm. These are very important, and I will go, there are 18 of them, but I'll go fast try to go fast with them, to show you how they correspond with the narrative of Ibn Abbas, Surah Al-Najm. In Surah Al-Najm, the Prophet ﷺ says, By the star when it descends, your companion has not strayed, nor has he erred. So he's telling, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling this to sahabas who had doubt. Once they heard the story of the Miraj, there were some Muslims who stopped being Muslims. So, when, so the Prophet ﷺ is telling them, and he's telling us that this story is true. He's telling today to us also, saying that no, Prophet Muhammad. 
nor does he speak from his own inclination, which means he is not making this up. Okay, this is the truth, and this is this this is a certificate. The son of the authenticity is coming from the Quran. That what Prophet Muhammad says about that is true. It is not but a revelation revealed, taught to him by one in intense strength. This is a revelation that is revealed. This is the revelation that Ibn Abbas is talking about. The conversation that Prophet had with God after crossing the Sadatul Muntaha. And taught him by one intense in strength. Now, a lot of traditional scholars interpret this, taught him by one intense in strength, as Jibreel and not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you read the ayahs, you will see one of soundness, and he rose to his true form. Now look at from 53, sir. While he was higher in the horizon, then he approached and descended, and was at a distance of two bow lengths, or nearer, okay? So, 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 so the orthodox version is, this is Jibreel alayhi salam, who is up there. Jibril, who cannot go beyond Sizzatul Muntaha, he cannot go beyond the tree or his wings would have burned, but apparently he is on the horizon and he is descending and coming down to, to two bowlands. This is the man who woke him up with his foot. Oh, this is an angel, sorry, not a man. This is an angel walking off with his foot and now it's coming down. The only difference is, according to the Orthodox version, is, is he is in his full original form, which is he's displaying his 600 wings made of gold and pearls. And then, and he revealed to his servant what he revealed. And this is the ayah that, in my opinion, confirms the story of Ibn Abbas because Prophet ﷺ is not the servant of Jibreel. So anybody who says that it was Jibreel who came down and revealed this story to Prophet ﷺ is saying that Prophet ﷺ is the servant of Jibreel. It is not. This is the same word, Abdihi. God took his servant from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. His servant, Abdihi. And the word Abdihi, people have argued that if it was a spiritual version, then you would not say Abdihi. He would not, God would not have used the word Abd. Because later on, Aisha disputes this whole thing. And she says, when she says that he did not go in body, there are only three people from classical sources who disagree with this version that he went bodily. Aisha, Muawiyah, who at that time was a pagan and planning wars against Prophet Muhammad and continued to fight wars against Prophet Muhammad for 12 more years. He and Hassan al-Basri, who I think was harassed by his Mutazalite students who did not accept the bodily version, right? So, but they are all... So, but the word Abdihi, how can it be used for... If you look at the 17 one, go back and look at 17, the first ayah, if you go back and look at the first ayah, Subhanallazi asra bi abdihi. Blessed is he who took his servant by night. And then you come back to the tenth ayah of Najm and say, Fa'awha ila abdihi. It's the same abdihi. This cannot be the servant of Jibril al This has to be God who descended up to two bow lands, confirming the position of Ibn Abbas. And then look at 5311. And he says, the heart did not lie what it saw. What is, what is this reference to? What did the prophet's heart believe in? Now people who go on, now you must understand that the position that the prophet ﷺ did not go in bodily form is a minority position. It is only, in early Muslims, it was only Aisha radiallahu anha and Muawiyah who believed it. And later on, Hassan al-Basri pushed this idea. All the companions believe that it is bodily movement. That is why it's a challenge to people then. It's a challenge to us now to believe this. So they all believe it bodily. But when Aisha said that he did not move, she used the word biruhi. Biruhi. He was taken by his soul. So it's ruhi. Biruhi. His soul. He was taken by ruhi. But... Where is this hard thing coming? This hard thing is coming when you go back to the narration and say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he said, I close my eyes, God returned my vision to my heart. So what, if you accept Ibn Abbas's version, what he is saying that the Prophet sallallahu heart did not make an error in interpreting what he saw. You could see a mirage, right? You could see, oh my God, that looks like a lake, and you dive and you break your head. 
Okay? So you, you could see things that you don't believe or you believe. So this is what this verse is saying. The prophet is not lying to you. He saw what he saw. Okay? He's not gone astray. We have revealed these things to him. And his, his heart does not lie. Now some people interpret it by saying, those who say that Prophet Salasam saw God but through his heart, not through his eyes, they use this verse to say that his heart saw it. But if you read the verse, it's not saying that the heart saw. The heart believed what he saw. He saw it with his eyes and the heart believed that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if you see a rhetorical question in the Quran, do not take it as a rhetorical. Be scared. Okay, if you see a rhetorical, this is a 5312 is a rhetorical question. So will you dispute with him over what he saw? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you a rhetorical question like that, he is warning you. How dare you dispute with him what he saw? This is how it should be translated. How dare you disagree with my prophet, who is my dear intimate friend? I spoke to him directly. He saw me. I gave him the greatest of gifts that I gave to no prophet. Forget about him. Right? So this is the narrative. So if you go, and then he says 53, 13, and he certainly saw him in another descent. At the low tree of the utmost bound. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this can't be Jibreel. And I'll tell you why it can't be Jibreel. Okay, if you go further down in the last ayat of Surah Al-Najm, it says, when they cover, the sight of the Prophet did not serve nor did it transgress its limits. This is a very important ayah, especially for Sufis, this is very important. They said that when Moses saw, he fainted. He soon. So Sufis interpret to say, you know, you know, see when people listen to the Sama and Ghazal and they go crazy and they fall, right? So Sufis talk about two kinds of Sufism. One is called the drunken, intoxicated Sufism, where people start dancing and go crazy and then they swoon and faint and have ecstatic moments. And then the other is the sober Sufism, where you don't. So the Prophet ﷺ demonstrated the correct and sober method of having a spiritual moment that neither do your eyes swerve, you don't faint, you don't perform anything, you're just looking and gazing in contentment. Time has come to a step. One scholar interpreted it very beautifully, he said, there is no time here. And the prophet is just looking at God, he's just gazing at something so beautiful, so splendor, so much full of bliss, that he cannot describe it. There are no words to describe The reason why the prophet didn't share it with us is he doesn't know how to share it. How will you describe it? What words are there in the, any language to describe what he's seeing? Plus, he's so lost in it, which is the concept of fana. He's so merged with God, he's so lost in it, that he has no self-awareness for him to come back and tell you what happened. There is no self-awareness anymore, because he's fully aware of God. He's not aware of himself anymore. He's completely focused on God. This is it. This is complete tawajjo. Complete tawajjo on God. There is nothing else exists. He's gone beyond Siddhartha Muntaya. There is no heaven, there is no earth. There is just God, there is Him. He's gazing upon God. His heart is still. It is calm. It has been calmed down by God. His eyes are steady and looking at God. This is, this is the highest moment of Islam. When Prophet ﷺ said, أَنْتَعْبُدُ Allah ka'annaka tarahu." Ihsan is to worship Allah as if you see Him. This is what He meant. Remember we talked about it last time? This is what he's saying. To worship Allah as if you see him. There he is. And I saw that. And it is there in the Quran. He, and if you look at 53.18, he says, He certainly saw of the greatest signs of his Lord. He certainly saw of the greatest signs of his Lord. So if you go to 17.1, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I took my servant from this mosque to that mosque to show him my signs. These are those signs. These are the greatest of signs. Do you think that Jibreel is the greatest of Allah's signs? I think Prophet Muhammad is a greater sign of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than Jibreel himself. Even Adam. Didn't they all bow to Adam? All the angels and all the jinns? I mean, Adam is a much greater sign than Jibreel. 
So it can't be that. It cannot be that. This has to be when you're talking about you're talking about the sifat and the zat of Allah. When you're talking about the attributes and the essence of God, those are the greatest of His signs. Now this whole version that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala saw is uh, disputed by Abu Zar and by Aisha radiallahu. Abu Zar asked his hadith says when I asked Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, uh, Pro- Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did you see Allah? He said, how could I see it? I saw light. That's what Prophet Muhammad, he's reported to say that, I saw light. And then the Sufis run with that and say, you know, there's a verse in the Quran where there are whales of light and darkness, 70 whales of light and darkness between us. And so what the Prophet ﷺ saw was the veil of light. So God was behind the veil of light when he spoke with him, spoke to him. But Aisha is very interesting. This person who hears what Ibn Abbas says, his name is Masruq, Masruq, yeah, Masruq. He goes to, to Aisha, Umm al muminin and says, did Rasulullah see God? Okay, this is after the death of Prophet And she gets very angry. And she says, anybody who tells you three things is a liar. One who tells you what is in the womb, and one who tells you that he knows when the end of times is coming. And one who tells you that Prophet Muhammad saw God. Who has said these three things is a liar. And then she gives a proof. And I find that thing. I've read the tradition many, many times over and over. Elsewhere she says, I asked him, did you see God? And he said, no. In Surah Al-Najam it is Jibreel. But she also says that his body was there, which is not possible. So I'm not assuming that those two traditions are really correct. How could the Prophet be sleeping next to her? She had not yet moved in. She moved in at least four years after the, after Miraj. But she, ah, she... This is what... Now this is... You can take this as a pinch of salt. Now this is my opinion. That what Aisha is doing is giving a fatwa. What Ibn Abbas is doing is just reporting. Says so this is what... Prophet Sallallahu told me. It's an authentic hadith, okay? The hadith has been authenticated by everybody, including him. No, but, but Aisha is saying that it is not true because, and she's giving an argument. She's making the argument, and she refers to these ayahs, okay? Her first proof is, is Aisha's first proof is this ayah. Vision perceives him not, but he perceives all vision, and he's subtle, and he's acquainted. Now, if you look at it, the word, what this ayah says that that eyesight cannot see God, but he sees vision. That is a very strange thing. You see? Vision cannot see God, but God can see vision. But she's interpreting it to say that nobody can see God. Do you understand? But what is interesting is that it is not a law. Like if you say that nobody, no human being can fly, yeah, unless God permits it. Okay, how many of us have our heart washed by Jibreel? Not once, not twice. So wasn't that heart prepared for this? Wasn't his heart prepared for this? So if you look at the verse I provide a little later, it is 94.1, expansion explicit. Okay. Did we not expand for you, Muhammad, your breast? This again further confirms the story of Miraj. Now there are two versions. There's one version that it happened to him in his childhood, 94.1, or it happened to him. I'm sure all of you have this memorized, right? Okay. Yeah, alam nashrah laka sadrak. Surah, all of us recite in Maghrib especially. So God saying, didn't I expand your heart for you? This, this expanding and clarifying his breast and chest was so that he could be prepared to accept this vision. He's not an ordinary, first of all, he's not an ordinary human being. He is Prophet Muhammad. He's a friend of God, number one. Number two, I'm sure if God, somebody, angel came and tore my heart up and washed and filled it with faith after I had the faith of Prophet Muhammad for 11 years. Beyond that, then you would be a very different entity that we are talking about. But there is still more. Uh, I don't know whether you are familiar with this hadith which both uh, Ghazali and Ibn Arabi use. It says that there is nothing in the heavens and the earth that can contain me except the soft 
tender, believing heart can contain me. And this hadith has no isnan, but there is another hadith which has complete authentic hadith. which says that the vessels of the heart, the, sorry, the vessels of Allah are the hearts of believers. The vessels, so our hearts, if you are a mu'min, your heart is the vessel of Allah, it can contain Allah. So a lot of companions of the Prophet Sallallahu except using those hadiths say the heart can contain Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala so the Prophet Sallallahu saw him with his heart and did not see him with his eyes and both these versions that he saw Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala with his heart so the he saw Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is a majority position now thanks to Dar es Salaam and a lot of Gulf and oil money that position is becoming weaker and weaker and weaker because a lot of money is being thrown at a particular perspective. But beyond that, the majority of if you go back, and especially if you read Imam Nawabi, he clearly says this. Imam Nawabi is very clear. He says that the majority position is he moves bodily, A, and number two, he saw God. Now, you, there are two versions of that. Like Imam Ahmed says, he saw him through his heart. Because there's another hadith from Ibn Abbas that said, I saw him in the most beautiful form, and he describes him as a man without a beard, as a young youth without a beard wearing a green turban. That's why Naqshbandis wear green turbans. Because in this dream, in that, Ibn Abbas says, the Prophet said, I saw him in a dream. So they are willing to accept that he saw him through his heart. Now, that is the vision. So I'm not going to push one or the two. To me, Obviously, Ibn Abbas's original position is much, much more dear. I want to believe that he saw God. That, that is very important for me as an individual. And it is a position that a lot of people believe in. But the other alternative is he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his heart. Now, you must understand that already we have transcended the laws of creation. Once you have gone beyond the seventh of heaven, you already transcended it. What you see and what you perceive doesn't matter. You know, you're perceiving. But you must understand that this is very important, gazing. This is what Moses wanted. He wanted to gaze upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and that is one of the rewards. In the hadith, it says very clearly that after that, we will be able to see God on the day of judgment as if it's a full moon on the horizon. We will see God like that. Now, what is interesting is that Ibn Arabi, Ibn Arabi is very, very special. He just thinks so differently from everyone. So I, I added his perspective. His perspective is very intellectual, so you can uh, please bear with me because I like this kind of view. And Ibn Arabi says, wait a minute, this whole idea of physical transportation to God doesn't make sense to me. How can you go to God as if God is there and you are here? Because the Quran says, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ He is wherever you are. The Quran says that God is there wherever you are. And God also says in the Quran that He's closer to you than your jugular vein. So why do you need an animal that will fly so fast? And He also actually, He puts it very nicely. If I were to write it, people would say, I'm cracking a joke. But He says, why would He need to tie Burak? Would Burak have run away? And so if Burak didn't run away, wouldn't the Prophet be able to come back? <coughs> so he, he's disputing some of these deals, but he's a big follower of the Miraj. He even claims that all other human beings can follow. So these are some of his proofs that I gave you, 57.4. It is he who created the heavens and the earth in six days, then established himself. He knows what penetrates into the hearts, etc. And then this ayah is fascinating, 41.53, which Ibn Arabi raises. He says, we will show them our signs in the horizon. This is the reference to the same thing. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed some of his signs up there and within themselves. So it sort of is consistent with the tradition of Ibn Abbas as well as Ibn Arabi's position that God is both inside you and there. So God is there and here as well. So you can find God here and you can find God there. So you can do etakaf here or you can go and do umrah there. You can find God there because He is everywhere. So just because He's here doesn't mean He's not there. So, so it, it is that point that He's trying to play. So why is all of these things so important for us? And I think this is it. To me, 
In the conclusion, as I put it to me, Isra and Meraj together constitute the most important spiritual and mystical moment ever experienced. This is Haq al This is the ultimate proof of God. It is not something proof. Like today, all Muslims believe that the Quran is real, true, and therefore believe other things because it is authenticated by the Quran. Okay? So, so there are three kinds of beliefs that Sufis talk about. One is yaqeen that comes from ilm, knowledge. Ilm is yaqeen. So I have knowledge of things. So how do we know about Moses? I have knowledge of Moses because I've read about his seerah, I've read about his book. But I also have knowledge of Sadiq because I see him. It's called Ayn al yaqeen I see him. And then the highest, I also have knowledge of Summer hot because I have experienced, so I, I know what it means to be hot. That is the experience. So the Prophet ﷺ has all three. He has learned about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from angels, he has seen him, he has Ayn al Yaqeen, and he has merged with him. So he has Haqq al Yaqeen, he has experienced the reality of the divine. That is the most profound thing that I draw from him. The traditional position is oh, he's the Imam of. That's not, that is trivial. He has in this life experienced reality of God. That is haqq al yaqeen. There, there is no way. That is why he was supposed to pray. The prayers that were obligatory on him were not obligatory on him. Because he had higher proofs of God. That he could communicate with God. God spoke with him like it was, but like no other entity, including Gabriel. He had that first hand experience of so what is our life? I think our life is about Miraj. It's not about Esfala, we all go travel, but it's about Miraj. It is to climb this ladder, to go through various darajat, different stages, different mahamas of spirituality, to reach that high position. Ibn Arabi interprets and says there is a spiritual state called Muhammad. Maqam in Muhammad. He says the station of Muhammad. And at that station of Muhammad, all prophets merge into one. So when he's talking about Adam, so when God says, I did everything to you that I did to everybody. I spoke to Moses, I spoke to you. I made Ibrahim my friend, I made you my friend. I sent Jibreel to help Isa. I sent Jibreel to you every day. You've been buddies for 23 years. And I did more to you. I gave you Surah Fatiha. I gave you things from my throne. And, and we are here. An intimate moment where I'm revealing to you things which you will reveal to nobody. And so this, is, this, this, this station is the ultimate which only Prophet Muhammad can. But our lives, inshallah, should be to, to, to transcend, to climb. The whole purpose of life is to climb this ladder of miraj. Jazakallah khair.